Yeah. Okay, so we'll make a start. Um, thank you all for joining us from wherever in the world you are. Um, I know we've got some a diversity of time zones represented and apologies for those of you who got caught out by the fact that Eventbrite doesn't always tell you what time zone an event is in. Um, my name's Cameron Nalen, um, along with um, the Koki team here, very excited um, to tell you a bit about what we've been doing um, in terms of looking at research impact and evaluation. This will be mostly technical in focus, um, but really trying to show what can be done, what could be done and, and, and where we might take it. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging that we here are standing on the unceded lands of the Wadjuk Noongar people and to recognise that there are people uh, attending from a variety of Indigenous lands around the world, um, not just in Australia. Um, I wanted to reflect on the fact that I am the legal owner of a patch of um, what we think is virgin bushland, or not virgin bushland, but um, unaffected bushland by the colonial incursion. And a few years, a few weeks ago, a tree came down. Um, this is a cross section of that tree, it's probably too small for you to see. It was about 250 years old. Um, and when I looked at it, I noticed that at the core of the tree, there are these quite regular black rings that become less regular about 80 or so years ago, 80 or 100 years ago. Um, and I'm guessing those are evidence of very regular cultural burning by the indigenous custodians of the land, stretching back not just for the hundred or so years of the life of the tree, but tens of thousands of years into the past. If we're thinking about how to evaluate knowledge and knowledge transmission and communication and engagement and impact, then we have a lot to learn from systems that manage to transmit knowledge over the course of tens of thousands of years. Um, as we said, we're recording the webinar. Um, please mute your microphone so you don't appear um, in the video, um, but feel free to leave your video on. And there'll be about 15 minutes of Q&A at the end. Um, we will also, um, we can also go over it if we, if we run over and there are lots of questions. Uh, there are a bunch of links, including the link uh, to this presentation. So do feel free to follow along um, from, your, from your computer at home or your office. So I want to start by introducing uh, Koki, who we are and what we do. The Curtin Open Knowledge Initiative is an initiative of Curtin University, funded by the Research Office at Curtin, the Faculty of Humanities, um, and the School of Media, Creative Arts, and Social Inquiry. Um, we are a humanities-focused project, um, and our goal overall is to change the stories that universities tell about themselves, placing open knowledge at the heart of that narrative. So you might think that that means we're a bunch of people talking about stuff, um, doing lots of criticism, um, but not necessarily changing things. But actually, we're really about making change. And one of the core ways we want to make change is by putting useful and relevant information resources in the hands of people who need them and who need to make decisions and who often don't have the information to support those. If you want to know more about that, uh, we wrote a book uh, with a group of other people um, internationally. It is, of course, open access and fully available online. You can also have it, have it in um, arboricidal form, as I heard something referred to um, this morning, uh, from MIT Press. So one of the core things we've done is tried to gather a whole bunch of data about the research process, about research institutions, um, and about what we generate. We have created and curated one of the largest uh, sets of data about research outputs that exists. Um, we do this by integrating open and publicly available data sources together. Um, and this creates a very large and very dynamic data set. The red lines through these numbers are the difference between when I first made these slides about five months ago and when I was checking the numbers last week making these slides for this talk. Um, so 130 million outputs, about 4 million researchers, 90,000 institutions. Um, it's a big data set containing some of the kind of things you'd expect and maybe some other things that you wouldn't necessarily think of as the kinds of things you'd track in terms of institutional performance. Um, among the products we've produced that you might have seen are the open access dashboard where we're tracking open access at the level of countries um, and at the level of institutions, not just universities, but also research institutions and indeed companies. 
uh, government research labs. Um, and for those of you who are interested in the PID graph and persistent identifiers, this is really a demonstration of what happens when you pull those identifiers together. This is a public, freely available website we're able to make free because the data is free um, and because the process we're using is really supported by a global data infrastructure. Um, and it's very simple and very general. Um, what I want to talk about today is, to, is a frame which is more perhaps relevant to the audience here. Um, and to talk about what we've done in terms of tools for benchmarking, for comparing the outputs that you might have, you might have collected for your institution, shown over here on the right of the slide. Um, again, start, so to do that, to start with, you obviously you have to collect all of your outputs, um, but you need something to compare it to. And traditionally, you might compare that to some sort of global comparator, um, but maybe you're interested in looking at a national output um, comparison looking at Australian outputs or maybe a selection of institutions that you care about or are partners or competitors um, or a selection of countries um, and what I want to make the point here is the tools that exist don't always let you make that choice don't always let you be flexible about the way you want to do that so if you collect a set of outputs that you're comparing to you're then going to need to put them through something to put them into categories now in Australia um, we tend to be focused very strongly on the fields of research codes and arguing about whether we're using the 2020 or the 2008 ones. Um, but for instance, again, Australian context, we might be interested in shifting the fields of education because we need to worry about our submissions for the TEXA validation process. Or maybe we want to compare the Frascati manual, because we're doing World Bank reporting, or maybe we want to compare to something entirely different, like a set of faculties or some sort of uh, discipline-specific categorization. Um, the point is, again, the tools you're used to will often give you a set of categories you can use, um, but wouldn't it be nice to be able to make that choice and, and change that? Um, obviously, you need to divide these up by year because things change over time, and we generally think about those in, in, in year buckets. So with that in hand, with a set of outputs from your comparison group, put into a set of categories, divided into a set of years, we can create a set of benchmarks, yeah, basically calculate a number for each of those little buckets. And then going back to our outputs, the ones for our institution, our school, our faculty, our discipline, our journal, um, we can then look at each of those and compare them to the category or categories which it fits into and say, you know, is this higher or lower? And then look across that and get some sort of sense of where the, the set of our outputs fit in the sense of the set of comparisons to the world, to the country that we might be wanting to make. So that's the kind of abstract version of what we wanted to look at, what we wanted to be able to do in general terms, to be able to switch in different categories, different ways of dividing it. You know, I haven't said anything about citations yet. We might, you might assume you would want to do this for citations, and we have done that, but you might also want to do it for something else. Uh, social media mentions, public engagement, news stories, um, other things that you care about and want to track over time, thinking about the engagement and impact agenda. So let's be honest, when we started building this, we were focused on the Australian Excellence in Research Assessment process, looking out beyond what was planned for 2023 to try and think about how we could help the design process and test the different kinds of benchmarks and systems. So in the era context for 2023, we would have been looking at the 2020 fields of research and we would have needed to create, we would in fact did create, a set of benchmarks. So that for 2023, that would have been these dynamic categories um, of the, 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 the dynamic RCI categories, one, two, three, four, five, and six. Um, we could have gone back to the old era process and the static ones, the high performance indicators, had a series of, of categories. So what would we need to do this? And can we do it? And can we do it in an automated fashion? So our data set, um, which we call the Academic Observatory, contains all of the outputs in the world, where they're affiliated to, so we can do the categorization, we can, we can get that world set of outputs, we can reduce it down to the correct set of journals um, that the ARC had, had designated. We have the specification for the categories, and that might sound like a trivial thing, but you actually do have to know what the categories are and to have an authoritative source of what they are. Um, and because the design for era 23 included a description of how we would divide the world set of outputs, journal articles, into the FORs based on the journal list, 
we can do that as well. And then the discussion papers and the reports described how to calculate the various sets of benchmarks. So we have all of that information. So we can do that, automate it. So it's straightforward, it's a lot of work, but it's straightforward. On the right-hand side, now we don't have your institutional submissions. We don't have the set of outputs that you've identified, and we don't have the distribution that you would have made of those outputs into the fields of research. But we do have affiliations for institutions, so we can model, we can identify which sets of outputs we assign in our data set to your institution and use that at least as a proxy for what the full set would look like. Um, and we can use the same journal-based approach at least, and we could have used a machine learning tool if we had one to hand that was, that was open source, um, but we're able to put those into the fields of research categories and then do those comparisons to build up the, the distributions of the categories of outputs that you have. Um, and Julian's gonna go into that in more detail and how that works in, in practice. What does it look like on a large scale? And this is where I will finish and hand over, is that we have a code base called RISE or RISE, but I think we've, we've set it on RISE. Um, and that code base, uh, for those that are technically interested in this, essentially based on a configuration file, generates a database query um, in SQL. That database query, which you'll see, the actual query, um, can be put into the Google Cloud system and that generates a set of output tables um, based on a, a public demo data set that we've made available. Uh, what we don't yet have is a nice interface for that. Um, but yeah, well, that's obviously a, a next step. The fact that era 23 was canceled meant that it didn't seem quite worthwhile spending a lot of time thinking about exactly what that nice interface would look like. Um, but just to give you the, the, the top level picture, the code base available at GitHub generates a query. The query runs in the Google Cloud platform. Again, this is a large data set and a large data operation. Um, it does all the work of pulling the data in and generating the tables, which are the results. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna hand over to Julian, who's gonna take you through the details of how that works in practice. Hey, thank you, Cameron, and hello, everyone. My name is Julian Tonti Filippini. I'm a um, data scientist here at Koki. I'm going to take you through the code base and the command line use of the utility that we've built. So, if you haven't got it open already, um, it's good to have this presentation open and also open up a command line terminal if you're comfortable you know, in a Linux shell or something like that, because we can be executing some commands as we go through. All right, so I'm just going to give a really brief technical overview of the system, and then I'm going to show you how to install it. Um, and then walk through the command line usage and finally look at some of the data that is generated by it. Okay, so the code base, as Cameron mentioned, is hosted on GitHub. Um, you can go there now and download it if you want. The easiest way that we shall do is go to the GitHub, click on this green code button, and then download zip. And that'll come down to your hard drive, open it up. And if you're on a Mac system, you can just right click on it and open a terminal at that position. And I've just got a little screenshot there of how to do that. Okay, so the data we're using is um, limited to 2016 for the demo set. Um, I have provided a link to the ETL scripts that are used to generate the data sets, but you don't actually need to run them. I've got the link here on this slide, the ETL script slide. That'll take you to the GitHub repo and show you how, this, how it's done. But we've pre-generated them and we're hosting them on the cloud, so you don't have to do that if you want, if you don't want to. Um, and if you click on that uh, data link, you'll see this list of files. The schema is there. It's all JSON L, if, if you're wondering. Um, they're all full data sets, with the exception of the raw papers data set there, which is limited, as I said, to 2016. Okay, so here's the too long didn't read version. Um, as Cameron said, you can generate one big file of SQL and run that, and it will build the whole database. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And this is where everything goes really, really wrong. <laughs> So here's one I created earlier in GitHub. Uh, it's about five and a half thousand lines worth of SQL. So I'll go to the raw version of this and just copy and paste it all. And then if you have a BigQuery instance, 
Um, I'm sure not all of you do, but if you do have one, you can go to BigQuery, create a project, which I've already got set up. Once it fires up, open a query editor, paste in all of that SQL, cross your fingers, press run, and we'll see if that starts to kick off. Okay, so that's kicked off. That should take about 15 minutes to run. So while that's running, I'll continue on with showing you how to install the code base. Um, yeah, so that, that's the take home message. If you have that SQL file, paste it in, run, and you're off. I won't need to go over that again because Cameron's already explained it. So let's get ahead with the installing. If you've got Docker and you're comfortable using Docker, you don't need to install anything. Just run this single command that you see on the screen and that will get you up and running with the uh, command line tools. So if you have Docker, run it now and you can skip ahead. For the, you don't need to listen for the installation section. If you don't have Docker, um, but you're on a Linux system or a Mac system, um, you can run this series of commands here, um, assuming you've got Git installed um, and that will go ahead and build the thing out. Um, if you're on Windows, you, I haven't tested it fully on Windows, but um, you can run it, but I would recommend that you install Windows Subsystem for Linux, WSL2, um, with Ubuntu and run it in there, um, or use Docker if you're on Windows. So this is for people who haven't necessarily got Node installed. So the, the programming language that I'm using is Node. It's, it's basically server-side JavaScript. I use that language because I'm a full stack developer, so I can use the same language in the web browser right across the whole stack. So if you run these commands on the, on the command line, it will tell you whether you've got Node NPM, which is the Node Package Manager, and NPX, which is a, it runs binaries um, for you. If you don't have it, go and get it from the Node.js website. Um, I would recommend using your operating system as package manager. Um, some people would prefer to use the pre-compiled binaries, but that's just the way I prefer it. And I've given some examples there of how you can use your operating systems package managers. On uh, Macintosh, you can use Brew. On Linux, APK. And on Windows, you could use Chocolatey, but as I said earlier, it's probably better if you use Windows subsystem for Linux. Once you've got Node installed on the command line, I always like to upgrade it just in case. I mean, if you've just installed it, it should be pretty recent. And my preferred tool for doing that is a utility called N. So this is using the Node Package Manager to install N, and then I upgrade to the latest version of Node. Um, and yeah, you've got the slides. So if, if you're not doing this live, you can do it later at your, in your own time. All right, so now that you've got Node up and running, then you pull down the repo. You can either download it, as I showed you before, from clicking on the green button and pulling down the zip file, or you can just run a git clone command and pull it down that way. Then once it's down on your computer to actually install all the packages, you go into the main directory where it is and you just run this npx pnpm install and that will bring all the packages in and that, that's it, you're ready to go. And you can also create a little alias if you want to make it easier to run on the command line. So and I'll show you that in action. So this is, I'm on my, um, my Macintosh here. So I type res, I can see a list of the various functions and utilities that are available on the command line. So res help, for example, will give you more information. Um, options will show you a list of all the available options that you can configure when you, when you decide to run it. And then I'll work through some of these uh, individual commands. So I've just showed you the basic ones, version usage help and options. Uh, there's a couple of little plot functions here which show you a graphical overview of how the system actually works. I should have them loaded up already. So yeah, so when you run them um, on, a Linux, on a Mac system anyway, it will open up your web browser and it will show you how everything is set up. These, I'll start with the overview. These are mermaid diagrams and they're dynamic. So you can modify them, change the style, anything you want to do there. This one here shows the really fine detail of how the whole thing builds. And this is dynamic as well. So if I make changes to the code base, then the way things compile and the order will be updated here. So you can see how everything works. I'm not going to zoom in on it here, but on yours, on your computer, you'll need to zoom in because it's super small. Okay, configuration. Um, as I showed you before, options will show you a list of the options available. If you want to test your configuration before you run anything, typing in test config will print it out. If there are any problems, it'll tell you. And here's where you can also experiment with changing settings. So for example, a common one would be that you have a different project in BigQuery. You're not going to call it what I've called it. So you might you know, call it you know, your project or whatever. 
and you can just test it to see if it works. It's happy with that, so that's fine. There is a little bit of a gotcha here on some of the Boolean flags. You do have to be a little bit careful. So dry run, for example. Um, if you want it to be false, you don't leave it off. You actually have to say that you want it to be false. Um, I'll just grab that so you can see what's going on better. Um, or you can put in a zero, have the same effect, or an empty string. But anything else will always be true. So if you have nothing at all, that's true. And if you have any value at all, that's going to be true. Just a little thing to be mindful of there. Okay, so as Cameron was saying earlier, this is basically a compiler. So it runs Node.js to compile out a whole bunch of SQL. And then you run the SQL and BigQuery. So it's a three-stage process. But if you have a, a connection to a BigQuery database, you can give that connection information to the REST system and it will, it will run the queries remotely for you. So, if, and you can test that. So, if I say res test uh, access, that's going to fail because I haven't told it where to find my connection information. But if I tell it where to look, demo, fingers crossed. Yep, and that works. So, that's one of the things you might want to set up, but not required. It's just handy to have. Um, there's nothing to stop you from just copying and pasting like I did in the example earlier. Uh, and that's just a list of the config options that are available with some example values. Um, so you can set your, your range, your age range, your uh, year range rather. So for era 20, whatever version you're doing, I think we were looking at 2016 to 2021, was going to be the, uh, the year range, it keeps saying age range. Uh, so you can set that to be whatever you want. You could have it 1900 to 2000, whatever, doesn't matter. Um, replace will overwrite your database if you already have it set up. So be careful with that one. Dry run will just run the commands and print them out without actually executing them on the server. So it's good to, to have that one. Okay, so some of the subqueries, I put them individually into the CLI so you can actually run them individually. Go and have a look at some of those. List will show you all of the queries that are available through the CLI anyway. There are other queries, but these are the only ones that are made available. So for example, if I wanted to look at the simplest of all queries, which is just ping. I can do that, or I can try to run it, but I will have to give my connection information. So if I don't provide my connection information, that won't work. But if I give it the demo, that should run. So that's now running on the server and it's coming back saying, yep, the server's alive. Okay, so cutting to the chase, um, the compilers generate thousands of lines of SQL um, it does it in four stages. The first one, compile raw, is where it's pulling in the raw data from that, um, that page of data files that we looked at earlier. Core is where it transforms those into a usable format for the rest of the database. Benchmarks, as Cameron was mentioning, is where it compiles the Australian benchmark and the international benchmark for doing ERA analysis. And then indicators is where it builds out some of the ERA-like indicators. Um, we don't build the whole suite, um, uh, just some of them. And compile all runs the whole lot. So that's the one we're going to do. Um, when you run compile all, you can just print it to the screen. You can put, put it out to a file or you can put it to your clipboard. So I will go ahead and do one of those. If I just say Reese compile all, then there it is. That's five and a half thousand lines of SQL. And that's exactly the same as what I showed you earlier, where I just went to the demo that I've uh, in the uh, GitHub repo, copied and pasted into BigQuery, same thing. So you could copy this, paste it and run it, or you could use your connection details and get it to run remotely, whatever floats your boat. Okay, so an example of one of the analyses you might wanna do is you might wanna look at your institution. So the way this works is with the analyze institution utility. To run that, you'll need to know what your raw ID is. So you click there, and I can give you an example, say Swinburne. And what you want is the entire URL, not just the tag at the back. Ooh, wrong way. There we go. And now if I run that, fingers crossed. Yep. So that's just run and generated all the SQL that I'd want to have. And I could then go into my um, BigQuery instance and run that. How are we going for time? Yeah. 
All right, so there were there are there are some other ones, but I haven't activated them in the public repo um, for analyzing individual fields of research and for analyzing date ranges. Um, I mean, the date range one works, uh, but I haven't built specific reports for it. Um, they'll be coming on online later if if anyone wants to have them. Um, but as because it got cancelled, it kind of threw everything in in the air. All right, so now let's look at some of the data that comes out of this. So the easiest way to look at the data is, <clears throat> is to go into BigQuery and just start looking around. So we can actually come in and see how our query is running that I started off earlier. I wonder if that's still running. <clears throat> still got another five minutes to go, but we can, we can still look at some tables um, anyway. So I called it demo. So this is what it's been building. Yep, it's nearly done. And we'll go through and look at some of those tables individually. So one of the first ones would be to look at the raw tables. So these are the tables that were loaded in from that page of data files. Um, they then get transformed into the core tables. So we'll look at some of them. We'll pick one core papers. Um, so this one is, this is pulling publication metadata information from our internal Koki database, which Cameron mentioned. It just pulls a subset of, of the data that we need. So for example, you have the paper, digital object identifier, the ID in um, era um, of the journal that's published in, uh, the year it was published, number of citations accrued to date, whether or not it's open source, open access rather, um, and then the institutions that are affiliated with it for, through the authorship list um, by their raw identifiers, <clears throat> whether there are any Australian institutions affiliated, which is relevant for the era analysis, and then a list of FOR codes that have been assigned to that particular research output. Um, up to three codes. I'm using the 2020 uh, version of the codes here, and I've got the four-digit codes and two-digit codes as well, and then the apportionment assigned to those individual codes. Now, because I haven't got the apportionment information from the individual higher education providers, I'm just assuming a flat uniform distribution um, and saying, you know, if there are three, I'm going to give them a third each. Uh, but the system is set up to allow that to have um, proper assignment. Okay, so another table that you might want to look at would be the benchmarks. So I'll go to benchmarks summary. And I, oh, it hasn't built it yet. Okay, we have to wait for that one to build. I might come back to it later. Um, let's see, RCI groupings. I can look at those ones. So when you calculate a relative citation um, impact score, it can be done on an individual output basis, or it can be done on a, on a set of outputs. And when it's done on a set, it's a different computation. It's using a weighted average. So that's what this is. And in the database, these are broken down by all, all sorts of different aggregations. So you can look at um, outputs aggregated by time, by institution, um, by field of research, and then any combination of those three. So for example, the highest resolution here is to look at aggregation by institution, by field of research, and by year. So if I click on that, I have the institutional ID, I have the field of research ID, I have the year, and then I can see, well, what was the, the local RCI calculated using the Australian context, what's the international one, and also what's the high performance indicator. Um, so that's, let's see if it's finished with the summary yet. I might have to refresh it. Yeah, I might just, yeah. Is it gonna be happy if I do this? Otherwise, I'll just go ahead and, and show some other things. Okay, yep, it's good. Benchmark summary, okay. So benchmark summary brings together all the, the other benchmarks into one place. So we have, <clears throat> and this breaks it down again by um, field of research and by year as well. Um, and it's used to establish scores for everything downstream. So per field of research, Per year, you have the number of total papers, the number that were unsighted, the citations per paper um, in the local context, in the international context. So this first line, for example, 3001 agricultural biotechnology, you can see that Australia is batting above the world average. So the average um, in Australia is 72 um, citations per paper. Um, the world is 35. Um, it couldn't calculate the high performance indicator in this particular case because the high performance indicator has some pretty aggressive uh, cutoffs, so it wasn't able to do that. We've also got the centile boundaries, so to qualify to be in the top 1%, you need to have 325 citations, 5%, 10%, so on all the way through. And then we have the upper bounds for the dynamic um, RCI and the static RCI 
in this table as well. And you can see what those values are. This is used downstream for all further analysis. Okay. I'll show a couple of other tables. I won't spend too long in here because you can look in your own time. So interdisciplinary, that's one of the era indicators, it's looking at how often fields of research are mentioned together or assigned together. Uh, we've got the low volume threshold here. So this will filter out any institutions that didn't publish enough in a field of research in a given year to qualify. Publishing profile is another um, era focused indicator. That's looking from a journal perspective, how does that journal perform versus other journals in a particular field of research and over a particular time frame. Um, then we've got the various RCI classes, tallies for all of these things, RCI groupings, as I mentioned earlier, and research outputs is the actual published works. And that's broken down again, grouped by, by year, by institution, by field of research and any combination of those. So you can do any kind of analysis you want to do there. All right, I might move on now. So about two years ago, Booker, uh, Booker, Google, Google purchased Looker um, for $2.6 billion. And only just recently, they finally updated their um, data analytics dashboard. So Google um, BigQuery is now connected with Looker Studio. Um, I haven't got any examples of it being used with the Reese database, but this is a generic example showing that it's got all the usual bells and whistles. So this is a Looker dashboard. Everything's interactive. You've got lots of different widgets, and that could all be plugged in to Reese. Okay, now, this is not in the public um, Reese database that you're looking at today, but we have a bunch of internal tools that we're developing using the same data set, um, just that the tools aren't available yet. So I'll show you a couple of those quickly. So this is one I made, which looks at the um, interdisciplinary data from the ERA um, analysis. So I'm saying each, each dot represents a field of research. They're colored by their, their type. So for example, green is biology, um, light green is human biology. Um, and you can mouse over all of these and zoom in and out, and drag them all around, all that kind of stuff. It makes a nice little graphic. And you can see, for example, that law down here, the legal fields are poles apart from quantum physics and so on that's over here. Cameron mentioned earlier that we're not limited to just using the ANSOS fields of research. You could use whatever you want. So here's an example where I've used the Microsoft Academic Graph um, concepts and mapped those along tight side fields of research to see whether they, they correlate and they do really nicely. So the things in dark blue are the MAG fields and the things in light blue are the FOR fields. So for example, software engineering is over here with software engineering. And you'll find that as you go through the whole graph, it's, it's like that everywhere. So that's that's working really nicely. And it's just showing that you don't have to use the, the FOR um, codes that, that ERA is using. You can use whatever you want. Okay. And then my last slide, this is another example where, and you, and you can use this. If you click on it in the presentation, you can go and play with this as well. It's just a um, dynamic time series showing each dot is a field of research. And in this case, what I'm looking at on the x-axis is the number of published papers in a given year. And then on the y-axis is the number of citations. It's both logarithmic. So you can see over time that the number of papers, number of citations is going up. That dip at the end isn't some crisis. It's just that we haven't accumulated the statistics yet. Citations accumulate over time. And I will now hand off to Catherine, who will talk about where we're going to go next. Okay. All right. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Catherine. I work with the technical team here at Cookie at Curtin University. Uh, let's make sure I've got the right mouse working. I'm just gonna sit on this figure for uh, a couple more minutes as well. Uh, let me just find my mouse and get over to the right screen. One second, sorry. There we go. Perfect. Uh, all right. So I think that this uh, figure, I'll just uh, go through and change a couple of the axis and uh, give you a bit of an indication about how powerful the RAISE system is and what the options, um, you know, what, what its potential is and what we can actually investigate with it. 
So if I just scroll down the screen here, so Julian's built a really, really beautiful system here, really nice interactive visualizations. Um, so I do encourage you to click on the links in the slides and go through and play around with it yourself as well. So part of the re system, we can actually take a look at what the impact would be on changing methodologies for benchmarking and how that would impact on individual disciplines or fields of research. So for example, if I take a look at the x-axis, let's change this down. And let's have a look, going back to a little bit of an era world at the moment, pop in the maximum citation count for the static relative citation impact to the RCI category three on the x-axis. And let's compare what was proposed for era 2023, which is the dynamic RCI category three, and have a look at what's going on there. So I'm just gonna change the years as well. So let's have a look at from say 2000 to 2020 and pop that up there. So you can also play around and take off regression lines if you like as well, rolling regression diagonal lines too. But what I wanted to quickly highlight here uh, is that we can immediately see what an impact in changing the benchmarking methodology would have had on specific fields of research. So if we take a look at the green health and human biology uh, FORs over here, we can see that there's been for 2020, a big shift upwards uh, to a higher benchmark. Um, when we compare the former uh, static RCI benchmarking methods to the dynamic RCI as well. So we can discuss this in a little bit more detail afterwards. We do want to leave a lot of time for questions. Uh, but what I really wanted to emphasize is that with the re system, what we can do is we can believe it's a really powerful tool for us to test and model what new approaches might be proposed for national research assessment. We're not restricted just to looking at FOR codes, as Julian and Cameron have mentioned. Uh, we can also take a look at other performance indicators uh, and how they may impact your institution. We can also take a look at how differences in ranking methodologies may impact your institution as well. So given that the national uh, institutional and research evaluation system is a little bit unknown at the moment, we don't know what's coming ahead, we think this tool is a really powerful way for us to test and model new approaches. So just going back to the slides here, so that's the end of the formal demo. We do have enough time for some questions at the end. Um, we'll turn off the recording, uh, so it gives a few minutes for that. But I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes discussing what our next steps are, where we would really like to take this. So Cameron uh, briefly mentioned some of the complexities that drive uh, some of the data sets um, uh, that are behind the uh, RES, uh, uh, the RES workflows. So we've provided the read code, the RES code base. Hopefully some of you have been able to get it up and running um, during this session. And we're really keen to chat to you about some more technical aspects uh, afterwards as well. And also email us at any time. We'll be keen to discuss that further. Uh, for those who are more technically minded, we'd love for people to start contributing to the code base. Uh, take a look at GitHub, put in some pull requests, make some comments in the code. We'd really love to build this out into a community managed infrastructure and have a lot more people contributing to it as well. But what have we provided with you today? So we've made the public domain data set available as well. So you're able to run the system from beginning to end, though with the caveat that we have only provided a snapshot of the global outputs from 2016. So for only one year, not all of the years. One of the reasons why we haven't done that is that it does uh, take quite a lot uh, to get these data sets that power the RES workflows up and running. So we have a technical team here at Koki who manage this infrastructure. We've had significant input from financial support from Curtin University and from, from some other major funders over the last five years as well. Our academic observatory uh, data sets are quite complex and dynamic. We process about 60 terabytes of data a week to produce these data sets. They are really powerful. Uh, we do have the code bases that power and generate these data sets also open source and available on our GitHub organization. So there's the links contained in the presentation. But for these data sets to be valuable to the community, they need to be usable, they need to be useful, uh, they also need to be sustainable long term. So we don't think that it makes a lot of sense for multiple institutions to spin up this infrastructure and run it, but you can with our open source code. Uh, we think it makes a lot more sense to split the infrastructure costs across multiple universities and really start to build out that community managed infrastructure. So we can have the infrastructure that produces some trusted and valued data sets on global research outputs and Australian research outputs, as well as tools like the RES code base that can really help institutions make some good decisions um, about what may be coming. 
So to that point, we could do consultancy projects. We could work directly with you. Uh, we can provide access to the entire data sets and do some really interesting, um, quite fairly complicated analysis and build out reports and visualizations. But what we'd really rather do at this stage is build a deep community collaboration with interested institutions. So we're thinking a sort of institutional membership model where we can share the infrastructure costs, but then also have those really deep conversations with other institutions in the sector uh, and work together to really build out this community managed infrastructure that can help produce trusted data sets and really powerful tools like the RES workflows. So we've got a lot of ideas about where we would like to take future development uh, of the RES, uh, the RES workflows in particular, but what we'd also be really keen to do, and that's why we wanted to leave an uptime for discussion as well, is talk with you about what, uh, what is important to you and your institution. What benchmarks would you like to analyze? What categories are important to you? Um, we've mentioned that we're not restricted just to looking at FOR codes. What other kinds of uh, research topic classification would we like to look at? Um, there's a lot of different possibilities and we really just believe that we're scratching the surface of what is possible. So to end, I would just like to ask the question, can we collectively build a national resource that's owned by the sector, that supports strategic decision-making and evaluation, that's based on transparent data and code for Australian needs. We certainly hope we can do that. 